Thanks for joining us today for this discussion about defense maritime activities. Today we hope to explore new solutions to familiar challenges as we take a slightly different approach to the conversation. Today we're fortunate to have some very vocal advocates of the U.S. maritime interests familiar to most of us in the room. Rear Admiral Mark Busby is a former administrator of the United States Maritime Administration, former commander of Military Seal Command, and past president of the National Defense Transportation Association. Today, he is a staunch supporter of the Merchant Marine and our nation's sea lift interests around the globe. Dr. Sal Mercagliano is the department chair of history, criminal justice, and political science at Campbell University. He's a maritime historian, a, fighter fi a firefighter, and runs a cross-platform social media effort called What's Going On in Shipping which has more than 135,000 followers on YouTube alone. And I think you said it's up to 140,000, and he's hoping to 144,000 after today's event. Subscribe and like. <laughs> John Conrad is a veteran oil rig captain, a, a former employee of the Deepwater Horizon owner TransOcean. He's a licensed captain of the world's largest ships, has sailed from ports around the world, and built some of the world's most advanced ships and managed billion dollar offshore construction projects in some of the harshest maritime environments. He's also a best-selling author who wrote Fire on the Horizon, as well as a founder and CEO of the maritime blog, G Captain. For those of you I have not met, I'm Doug Hall. In my past life, I spent some time on K Street advocating for our maritime interests. And today I serve as the Chief of Legislative Affairs for United States Transportation Command this is an honor, and I'm excited to moderate today's panel. So let's get the conversation going. U.S. Transcom supports the Navy's program to procure used foreign-built ships off the commercial market to recapitalize the immediate need for strategic sea lift. And we also acknowledge the desires of the Congress to build new sea lift ships in the United States. The U.S. government has done both in the past, and we're interested in this morning to explore options that maybe neither side has talked about before. As General Van Ellis told the Congress in testimony, the average age of the government-owned Roro fleet is 44 years old. If we stay on the current Bayou's trajectory through the end of the fight up, the average age of the government-owned Roro fleet will be 44 years old. The Congress has authorized the new build sealift program for 10 ships and may be appropriating money for the design of those ships. The Congress is also impressed with the vessel construction manager con uh, concept for the National Security Multi-Mission Training Ships and encourages the department to use that model in the event appropriations are made available for the construction and acquisition of those ships. However, many argue that may not be in the taxpayer's best interest to build new ships and place them in a reserve operating status. There have been studies after studies published over the years that advocate for a new model for our strategic sea lift. The Center for Strategic Bud Budgetary Assessment Study strengthening the U.S. maritime industrial base called for a national type of fleet. And the Hudson Institute recently published a study calling for an expansion of the maritime security program. During a speech last month, last month at Harvard, Secretary Del Toro, <coughs> the Secretary of the Navy, stated that maritime statecraft, in a broad sense, encompasses not only naval diplomacy, but a national whole of government effort to build comprehensive U.S. and allied maritime power, both commercial and naval. He's even spoken to Wall Street investors on ways to invest in both combatant and commercial shipyards to enhance the military or the maritime industrial base. Ultimately, it will take a, a, a whole of government approach and a national will to make this successful. That's a lot. So the goal of this panel is to explore new approaches to those familiar challenges. So let's jump right in. So the Maritime Administration has started its efforts to develop the National Maritime Strategy. What elements, uh, Admiral Buzzy, do you believe, and all the panelists really, uh, are essential to be in that strategy to make it successful? Uh, thanks, Doug, and good morning, everybody. Good to be with you all. Uh, as someone who has tried and failed to produce <coughs> a National Maritime Strategy, and my predecessor, Chip Janikin, uh, feels my pain as well because it was a turnover item from him to me to try and get it done uh, last time, a, a national maritime strategy is not going to be, and, and Ann, this is for you, is, is not going to be accomplished by CNA doing a study and then 
handing it and saying, here's our national maritime strategy. There are so many uh, constituents, so many fingers in the, na in the maritime pie, uh, it goes above the cabinet level. Uh, you know, there was, there was zero recognition of the leadership of MARAD or the Secretary of Transportation to lead such an effort to develop a cross-government national maritime strategy. It, it needs to come from the White House, quite frankly, National Security Council as a minimum. If there's to be any hope to get DOD, Commerce, uh, State, uh, Interior, uh, Transportation, all of the uh, DHS, all of the constituencies that have um, equity in a national maritime strategy, to get them all singing together, it's going to take a White House level effort. So uh, I, I look forward to the CNA study. I think it will advise the conversation, but if it's not embraced at the White House level, it's going to be a very, another very nice study that we all read, nod our heads up and down about, and, and be ops normal. Uh, and that's from somebody with lots of wounds on my back from trying to make it work at the MARAD level. Well, you're the historian, any comments? <clears throat> Yeah, uh, three years ago I wrote a piece for Sea History magazine where I talked about what I consider the first actual national maritime strategy, which was the Jones Act, two words that we're not supposed to say, but I'll say it. Uh, Merchant Marine Act of 1920, when you look at what the Merchant Marine Act of 1920 was, we tend to focus on one section, section 27, the cabotage section, but when you look at what was created in 1920 in the ashes of World War I, what we created was a holistic maritime strategy. It involved shipbuilding, it involved uh, tariffs, it involved uh, uh, monitoring cargo rates. Uh, it created what eventually becomes the Maritime Administration. Uh, it dealt with international shipping. It dealt with everything that we needed so that should we encounter a peer-to-peer -peer conflict in the future, our maritime uh, infrastructure was in place. And it was very successful. Uh, it is not just Senator Jones from Washington, it was Representative Green from Massachusetts, and it was Admiral Benson, the very first Chief of Naval Operations, who later becomes the head of the shipping board, uh, to oversee that. And it is successful, we see it in fruition in World War II, but the problem is over time, since that period of time, 103 years later, we've seen the national maritime strategy that was created in 1920 whittled away. Uh, parts of it have lapsed, parts of it have gone away, uh, it's been overcome by new technologies and new types of shipping that we never foresaw, the idea of open registries. Uh, and unfortunately, our legislation hasn't kept up with it. And uh, I agree with Admiral Busby that this is something that has to be drawn from a national level. And I am very optimistic in that we have just saw a passage of things like the Ocean Shipping Reform Act, where you bring together Representative Garamendi from California, a Democrat, and Representative Johnson from South Dakota, a Republican, there's a lot of interest in this topic. And I think we need to be driving that interest even more out into the public and out into the government. John, you have any comments on the National Maritime Strategy? Right, well, first I, I have to apologize. Some of those marks were from my, my publication and I, um, three administrators um, are, are staring at me and GCAM's been critical of MARAD and the Maritime Strategy. <coughs> But I, the apology comes because um, it's, it's not their fault. We have to look at MARAD has 800 employees compared to the FAA, which has 40,000. The entire Coast Guard has 40,000. NAVC, the shipbuilding and repair arm of the Navy, has 86,000 people. MARAD does not have the influence that it needs in order to get out there and make a difference in the media, in Congress, in the White House. And this is having a profound impact, not just on sea lift, but world events. Look at our biggest challenges today. We have inflation, global. That started with the port congestion crisis. Marad's in charge of ports. We have the European energy crisis. Well, there's plenty of oil and energy out there. It's getting it to Europe. It's a maritime problem. The world food crisis, getting ships out of Ukraine. There's food in the real world, fertilizer, but how do you get the ships? So all of these issues that are happening on a global stage are coming into a maritime domain, but because 
we've whittled away the statistics and uh, the, you know, the down to 800 people in Marat and these other organizations, our nation is blind to the reasons of this. And coming out of 20 year global war on terror, we look at things through the lens of the army and, and sometimes the Air Force, but we don't see that maritime domain and we have to see it's not just critical to national security, but big geopolitical and strategic values, and, but we, we don't see it. There's not one ship captain like me working anywhere in the Pentagon or at any think tank, so we're, we're blind to the importance of this. I will tell you that the Maritime Administration, the Department of Defense are in lockstep, as you've seen us testify before Congress, and we very much appreciate the, uh, the, the support we've gotten from all of you and the Congress to make these, these successful. And we will be, Transcom will be an integral part of that strategy. So we look forward to, you know, that publication and seeing if we can get that national will at the national level. And I know we've got supporters like Mr. Garamundi and, and, and the Congress to help us out there. So um, talking about a national will, we had a call and we were talking about that national will. Uh, it looks like China has a national will to make their national maritime industry, in fact, uh, robust. In fact, they're building Roros now uh, to export electric cars and they're building those railroads in China with military utilities. Are those, are those type of features things that we should be looking at? I know Mr. Garamundi talks about rebuilding the Jones Out Act fleet from the ground up with military utility, but any thoughts or comments on, on us as a nation doing things like that? We used to do this as a matter of course. I mean, the Maritime Administration used to superintend entire classes of ships that had uh, military functionality uh, and a whole process that, uh, you know, brought them into the Merchant Marine and gave us the type of ships that we needed uh, from both from a sea lift point of view, but also from a, uh, a commercial maritime point of view. And it, and it worked very, very well. Yeah, I, I won't bore you with the history, but uh, there was a bifurcation between the commercial and the military side, kind of post-World War II. And what China has done is basically swallowed Alfred Thayer Mahan, and they have adopted the idea that military and commercial are symbiotic together, that they are very complementary to each other. If you look at Chinese shipyards right now, which are building 46% of the world's ships, just one ch Chinese shipping company, the Chinese state shipping company, builds 20% of the world's ship. Where they're building aircraft carriers and cruisers right next door to them are passenger liners, are, are container liners, are LNGs. Uh, China is on the growth when it comes to shipbuilding, and in many ways, when I look at it as a historian, China isn't really communistic, it's not capitalistic, it's mercantilistic. They are trying to secure trade routes, they're trying to secure multiple trade routes, their imports, their exports, and they're being very successful at doing that. And, you know, well, a lot of people want to talk about, well, we can use our allies and build overseas. Look at the Japanese and Korean shipyards. They're decreasing in size while China is on the rise. And again, this is of vital importance. Uh, I don't buy the idea that we can't do it, that we've lost that. Uh, if you look at where we were prior to World War II, we came back and were able to do it. Uh, 20 years ago, if you were buying a Chinese ship, you would have a very different opinion today than a Chinese ship coming out now. And, and we see that progressing. I mean, it's, I don't even know where to begin because the topic on so many levels, 200 times the ship bill and capacity. Uh, you know, one of the early articles I, I wrote critical of, of Marad was, Admiral, I'm not ready for war. I don't have the convoy training as a merchant marine captain. I don't have the communications training. We have SSOs and so forth, but we only have 85 ships. And we're not working particularly well with our allies. The biggest naval force in the entire world is the Filipino merchant marine. We talk about working with allied navies. Are we working with our allied merchant marines to bring in that capability? Where China is bringing in the, the Belt and Road Initiative and they're militarizing uh, their, their merchant marine with the maritime militia, giving these trainings so they not only have their own fleet, but they can put their mariners on flags of convenience and other foreign flags. And you have to look, there was just an excellent book by a former um, Naval War College uh, professor, Mao's Army Goes to Sea. Again, when I went to the Navy League conference and we, we all talked there, I mean, they, they, the Navy League barely fit the one Gaylord Hotel in, in Maryland. The Army conference I was at last week, the, all the hotels in Washington, D.C. were sold out. 
That's the legacy of 20 years of global war on terror and looking at the, at the land side. This book talks about how China went from an, from an army, and it's still the People's Liberation Army Navy, into a navy, and they did that primarily by utilizing commercial assets, utilizing ferries and fishing boats and so forth in the end of the you know, war against the Chinese nationalists. So they're, they're not interested. They are building a big fleet of navy ships, but they are more interested in utilizing the commercial ships. And they're smarter about it. We're purchasing uh, roll-on, roll-off vessels, which have a lot of stability concerns, a lot of damage control concerns, where they're using off-the-shelf ferries. Ferries are built to a higher standard, safety standard, salvage standard. And they're not only building uh, those ships that are more survivable, but they're building a salvage a fleet. They're building icebreakers to enable those to get out. They're building fire boats and salvage equipment to repair those ships. So it's almost every single metric that, that, that we're, we're falling upon, except the global expansion. But as we know, they're purchasing ports around the world, and we're not sure how, how they're going to use that. So let's talk about the recapitalization efforts that we've got ongoing right now. So we have successfully purchased five ships off the commercial market. Two of those were members of the Maritime Security Program, obviously have military utility, and three are a little bit different, adding different capacity. But commentary in the, in the press uh, is, is ripe with criticism about what we might be a, doing to enable some of our competitors by doing, buying used ships off the commercial market. Yeah, true enough. I mean, the, the uh, <clears throat> original plan put forth by, uh, by the Navy uh, for recapitalization was uh, three-pronged, three and this was testified before Congress on many occasions. Uh, upgrade some of the current RRF fleet that was uh, reasonable to upgrade, that had service life left. Uh, replace uh, a, a portion of the ships with newer used vessels off the open market and then ultimately build new sea lift ships. And that was kind of the plan uh, that the Navy put forth and Marad signed up to and off we went and we began uh, down that road. Uh, but the, the plan was, was rightfully uh, pointed out that it was never going to get us a newer fleet in, in enough time. It was always just going to be marking time uh, and kind of one of the added un, unwritten sort of uh, outcomes was many of those ships that we were buying from the open market to bring into the RRF fleet were being replaced by the commercial companies with ships being built in China. So we were essentially paying China, or China was benefiting from our program, uh, and we were still getting old ships, older ships. Um, so there was obviously some concern there. Uh, we all, I think, ultimately wanted to get to uh, newer ships, new build type ships, but then becomes the rightful argument, do we build an entire fleet of new sea lift ships uh, only to have them just leaning against the pier all the time collecting barnacles? And is that a efficient use of our sea lift fleet? Is that an efficient use of taxpayer dollars? So. You know, there's, we worked, when I was at Marad, and I'm, I know Chip worked the same thing, looking at various options to have a more active reserve fleet. In other words, a fleet that uh, perhaps you build new ships to go into commercial service with the idea that they will transition uh, into the, a reserve capacity at the 10 or 12 or 15 year point. We get another 10 years out of them and then they uh, rotate out, something like that that makes a lot more sense. Or just expand the MSP program. Congress uh, talked about that for many, uh, many years. Just go from a 60 ship MSP program to 120 ship. Just have all of the reserve capacity exist in the MSP fleet. Uh, you know, there's pros and cons to that as well. Uh, you know, where's, where's the cargo that those ships are going to carry? Um, you know, it's not, a, it's not a panacea by any means. But I think doing something different than they were doing now. The, the, the formula that we're working on right now uh, is, is probably not the long-term solution. 
that maybe is a transitional solution to get to a more reasonable program that builds new ships, the types of ships that we need, the types of ships that uh, you know, industry can use uh, that will be useful, but also will then be useful uh, militarily should the time come. I wrote my dissertation on the role of the Merchant Marine in national defense. If anyone wants to go to sleep at night, just let me know. I'll send you a copy of that. Uh, one of the things I looked at is, is the history of this. And if you look at Korean War, one of the things that we did immediately is realizing that we were glutted with ships left over from World War II. So Admiral Cochran, who is the first head of the Maritime Administration, initiated a program to develop the Mariner program. 35 ships spread across seven yards. Uh, you were building what became the C4, brake bulk ships, really the epitome of brake bulk technology. Built for the government, leased out to commercial firms. They proved to be extremely popular to the point that commercial firms bought them up, and that became the norm going in. Vietnam War, we have an issue with getting cargo into Vietnam. We go to this, this, this maverick guy who has this idea of how to revolutionize shipping called Malcolm McLean. He sells this to the government, and you alleviate the issue there. Post-Vietnam, we realize we have to fix shipping so that we're ready to uh, respond. We create the Ready Reserve Force in 1977. We do a float pre-positioning in the 1980s. Uh, we buy some uh, used uh, container ships that go really, really fast and convert them into fast sea lift ships. And we keep adjusting to that post-1990, uh, the Gulf War. We add to the RRF, we build $6 billion worth of large medium speed rows, 15 new construction, five conversion. But the one fundamental issue we kept missing on here was the commercial merchant marine, is making sure that that commercial merchant marine was there as an added uh, element to feed from. And while we passed the Merchant Marine Act of 1970, which tried to build 300 ships across 10 years, it came up short. And even in uh, post Persian Gulf War, we got MSP, but we didn't get the construction differential subsidies. And I would argue that a lot of the issues we see in shipyards right now in our repair capacity comes from the fact that we haven't built a commercial vessel for international trade since the 1990s. Really, it's been the Oil Pollution Act, the Double Hull Tankers, and the Jones Act that has done that. And this is where I go, where we have to look at this whole issue holistically, where we need to be advocating for this commercial shipbuilding and the military shipbuilding, and countries are doing it. China spent from 2010 to 2018 $132 billion in ship subsidies. In that same period of time, MARAD, through their Title 11 program, provided 77, not billion, million dollars. So it's a fraction of a percent of what we're investing in the commercial industry. Mm -hmm. That's an important component. How much are we doing in subsidies? But you also have to look at the financial angle behind this is critical. Money is flowing from Wall Street into Chinese shipyards. Uh, Katerina Pastor is a, a legal uh, professor at, at Columbia. She wrote The Coded Capital, how the legal structure enables money to be hidden in corporate structure and legal structure and to protect the banks. Look, a couple of years ago, I, I, we'd go to all these conferences and I'd tell people the, the plight of the Merchant Marine and the, and the, the problems with shipbuilding, and no one, no one really cared, uh, Doug. But now, the very highest levels are concerned. I don't think sea blindness is an issue anymore. Secretary Del Toro's speech at, at Harvard about integrating in the finance is amazing. I hope everyone, um, everyone reads that, and he's not alone. You had Gallagher, Representative Gallagher, going to Wall Street. Paparo was just in, um, Admiral Paparo was just in Boston talking to the banks. But we're asking them, we're saying, hey, be American and close down these financial flows into Chinese industries and yard and invest in American shipyards. We're, we're trying to appeal to their patrioticness, uh, but these are companies. And we can pour subsidies into, through Congress, into MARAD, and I hope we do, we need to, and Navy into, into NAFC, but that money has to filter through the bureaucracy. And it doesn't get to the shipyards in time. These shipyards are commercial entities. Our largest shipyard, HII, which does our nuclear aircraft carriers, it does <coughs> frigates, it does nuclear submarines, 
Its market capitalization is $8 billion. Now that sounds like a lot, the total worth of the company. But Raytheon's is over $100 billion. Boeing's is $80 billion. So it's a tiny, it's a tiny fish in this pond. Well, what does that do? When the Navy issues a contract, they have to build the facilities. Look at what's happening at uh, uh, the Cantieri yards. They're investing in equipment and, uh, and people. That takes an upfront cost, and they have to borrow money from the bank. But when your market cap is only $8 billion, you take that money from the junk bond market at an incredibly high rate of interest. And I, I see some commercial operators here nodding their heads. It's very difficult to get a loan in this from the banks, and not just a loan, but these coded capitals and other <coughs> arrangements. So we can write these laws to close down the, the loopholes sending money into, into China, but we need the laws in, in Congress in order to back the risk. The reasons the banks, the, the cost of capital is so high is the banks know that many of our shipyards and commercial operators are going to go under, they're going to go bankrupt. So if we enact a law in Congress saying, hey, if this goes bankrupt, we will, we will nationalize it or subsidize it, well, that takes the risk off the bankers and lowers the cost of capital into those bankers. And this is not something we talk about here. And the financial guys, if you go to the Marine Money Conference, they don't come here often, and we don't see many military there often, because on the military side, you say, well, this, this, this is career risk. There are risks in, in working with Wall Street, and that's correct. And for them, some of these bankers are guilty of, of pouring money into China and don't want, to, don't want to talk about it much. So we need not, you know, the Admiral Paparos and Del Torres, not to have these appeals to patriotism, but we need to sit down with the bankers and say, what do you specifically need? What laws? How do we write these laws? How do we create our own coded capital and get it, get it out of government? Because we can't just pour congressional money. And I think, you know, you know Chip Busby's and program with the, with the training ships is an excellent example. If we get this out of government, put it in the hands, and we can still monitor and regulate it, but those financial terms. And I know this is long, but I want to be really important. HII's $8 billion market cap company. We had VT Halter, which invested hundreds of millions of dollars in upgrades of their own money. They have something like $8 billion in, in contracts, and they have valuable waterfront real estate. That shipyard just sold in secret negotiations, but to Bollinger for $16 million. So here's a major shipyard. I think there are numerous people in this room that could raise $16 million, and they're not, they're not alone. Metal Shark is now on, you have Austell. These, these, especially with interest rates are going up, these shipyards are in dire need, and we have to understand the capital that backs them and lower that cost and risk. What made the vessel construction manager successful, sir? You were there when it inception, and, and what could that look like if we went to a sea lift construction type model off of that? Yeah. And is there capacity in the United States to capitalize on that? Yeah, I, I think uh, you know, Congress directed Marad to uh, use a, a, a party, an entity other than the Maritime Administration to a constructor, so the vessel construction manager concept was born, and I think it was a stroke of genius, and I think it's played out in its result, uh, you know, of allowing an entity uh, that has recently built ships, in this case it was Tote, uh, who has experience in contracting, you know, a commercial type vessel uh, down to a very fine point. Uh, and uh, you know, working with uh, with a shipyard, a private shipyard, to get the kind of result we wanted a a fixed price uh, with a with a you know fixed time delivery and a very mature design. Uh, you know, all those elements kind of really led into it. Now, you know, in all, in, all, in total honesty, it hasn't been exactly on schedule. It's been it slipped a little bit, but you know, in relative terms to um, shipbuilding projects, 
at least American Shipbuilding Project, it's pretty damn close to being on time. It's very close to being on budget. You know, it had COVID and cost of steel and a few other things entered in, but it's a very small margin of, of growth. Uh, and the ship was built essentially as it was designed. And that's why we're seeing the result uh, in the Empire State that was just recently uh, christened and delivered up at uh, SUNY Maritime. And uh, the other four are coming right behind it, uh, right on schedule and right on time. And uh, you know, it was, it's a perfect example of, of how it can be done in an American shipyard. Uh, and I think there's other shipyards that could do that as well. And there's other programs like a sea lift type ship that would benefit greatly from this kind of an approach. Like it, uh, when you look at you know, the $321 million we spent to build that ship, uh, with the cost estimates when we originally took it to NAVC, we we're gonna be uh, eight to nine million for the same ship. You know, the cost savings are pretty, um, pretty apparent. So I think, you know, we should be building hospital ships, quite frankly, to that design. Um, you know, we could replace the two existing hospital ships easily with that design, uh, just tacking it right onto the existing contract or, or renewing an, another contract quite easily. I know we want to open it up to questions from the audience based on the, the last panel, but before I do that real quick, We've talked about finance, we've talked about construction differential subsidies, we've talked about MSP. What are we missing? Is there something out there that we're just sea blind to or there's no panacea, I know that, sir? What's it gonna take to get that national will? What are, what are we missing in our conversation? I'll add, just, I, I think it's the visibility. Uh, you know, I, I joke about running a, a YouTube channel where people won't tune in to watch about shipping. And what galvanized people to come watch me is not this space. This is not why they come to watch it. They come because they have an interest in it. And I think one of the things we saw was how precarious our supply chain situation was. One ship, sideways in the Suez, pinched off 12% of the world trade. And people all of a sudden realized that this was a problem in 2020. Why can't I get toilet paper? You know, COVID did many things, didn't make us go to the bathroom more. But we all of a sudden realized how just-in-time logistics was an issue for us to move ahead. And I, I think the thirst is out there for knowledge about this. Uh, we do a very poor job, in my opinion, of getting that information out. Like any other profession and any other occupation, we are great at talking among ourselves. We are terrible at talking about and educating this outside. You know, just the role of the Merchant Marine in World War II, which was an epic story, 733 ships sunk, 9,500 merchant mariners killed in World War II. Uh, the histories of the Air Force and the Marine Corps in World War II are five volumes. The history of the Navy is 15 volumes. The history of the Army is 79 volumes. The entire history of the Merchant Marine in World War II is 80 pages. That's it. We do a terrible job about educating and making people understand this. And one of the things I think that we recently saw with the supply chain crisis with what China is doing, with what's going on today around the world, is people wanna know more about this topic. And we have to do more to educate not just the public, but government officials, not on a federal level, but a state and local level. And we've got a lot of vehicles to do that. We've got the state maritime academies. We have in organizations like the MDTA. Uh, this is what we need to do. We need to get that in front of people and make them understand that if you're on a farm in Iowa, global shipping matters to you. I think absolutely, and you know we can we can advocate for ourselves, but that's that's always difficult. You you sound like you, you know I've been accused of whining and and boasting about the importance of the maritime, and it's difficult to talk about yourself that way. And now that General Van Ovost is is gone, you know with, this is incredibly powerful having a four-star Air Force Admiral with with Admiral Phillips standing behind, beating the drum. We need sea lift but we need it from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, we need it from the Navy. What the Navy has done over the last 20 years is, you know, and it's hurt shipbuilding, but what they do extremely well is working with allies and servant leadership to the other branches. And now the Navy is in trouble and Sealift is in trouble. And it would go a long way for the Chairman of Joint Staff to come to Admiral Phillips' uh, talk and say, this right here is important because the American people don't know what, what MARAD is. 
they understand uh, the CNO. They understand the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They understand the national security chairman. So until they, those guys make the national headlines saying, hey, look, at, look here. And it's critical the Air Force, you know, is going to need the fuel or tanker crisis to get the fuel to the forward air bases. The Army is the biggest requirement of supplies in the Pacific. And putting money into MARAB, particularly in DOT, is a lot easier from the congressman I am than putting it in the DOD and watching it trickle down. It can be direct, and it doesn't have to come out of each individual service budget. Um, but those leaders need to stand up like General Ovos and support this, say, hey, this here is important, and they have to admit failure. We have to admit that our sea lift is not almost ready or thing. We're absolutely failure, and Congress, we need money. And the Admiral Busby did that with the, with the training ships. Uh, the FMC has done that with, with there. They've grown significantly uh, since 2020 by standing up in conference at, at Congress and saying, we are failing here and getting, getting larger, more influential people to back them up and ask direct. We don't need another study. We don't need another look. Everyone knows this is broken. We need specific money and resources, and we need the assistance of the influential people in this country to stand behind Admiral Phillips and, and uh, Transcom and say, this, this is important, and we need to do it right now. We don't have time. I appreciate that, and I, I will acknowledge, we, I mentioned MSP, and, and you mentioned fuel tankers. We're grateful that we have tanker security program now. Hopefully some of our operators here enjoying this conference, and, and we're grateful to have that part of our emergency preparedness portfolio as well.